Welcome to Transport Action Canada's 46th annual general meeting and third one we've held entirely online. We will begin this afternoon's agenda with our guest speaker, Claire Trevena. I hope I'm saying that right, Claire. You are, thank you very much. Um, followed by my annual report as president and then the business part of the meeting to review our financial statements and elect the board of directors for the coming year. Each of us today is joining this meeting from the traditional territory of one or more of the many First Nations who have inhabited this land for thousands of years before settlement and before the building of the railways and before Confederation. At this time, I invite each of you to reflect upon the history of your communities in which you live and work and how we can work to get towards seeking solutions that build a better future together for all. Safe and reliable transportation, which we work for, is just one of many threats that must be woven into the tapestry of reconciliation. The land from which I'm joining this meeting today is part of the traditional territories of the Three Fires Confederacy of Southwestern Ontario, the Ojibwe, Adawa, and Potawatomi Nations, and is now also home to the Delaware Nation. And now I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, Claire Trevana, uh, former Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure of British Columbia. Claire's roots are in journalism. She was a reporter, producer, and editor for the BBC, The Guardian, and the CBC, amongst others. And prior to entering electoral politics, um, Claire led strategic communications and democratic development projects around the world, including earning the Canadian Civil Civilian Peacekeeping Medal. She was elected for four terms as MLA for the large rural constituency of North Island in BC. And her working government include, include a broad range of shadow cabinet roles, as well as serving as terms of deputy speaker of the BC legislature. And Claire regards having served as Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure as having finished her political career on a high note. Um, Claire tells me she cycles and walks and loves road trips and exploring the beauties of BC and Canada. So uh, Claire, good afternoon and thank you for joining us. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. And um, unfortunately, with the high price of gas, our planned road trip across Canada has been cancelled. But I'm really pleased to participate uh, in your AGM. Uh, I'm speaking from the traditional territories of the Wewake, Wewakam, and Coast Salish First Nations, the liquid speaking peoples. Uh, and for those of you who don't know that, that I live on Quadra Island, and that's the territories of the Quadra Islands. It's part of the Discovery Islands, um, which is, uh, you look at it, if you look at a map of BC, it's the cork in the channel, uh, top of the, uh, the Strait of Georgia, the Salish Sea. Uh, that's where I am. Um, it's an island the size of about Manhattan. It's got a full-time population of two and a half to 3,000 people. We've got... Um, an elementary school, we've got a pharmacy, we've got two uh, very good grocery stores, two government docks, um, doctors, li public library. Wonderful place. And I'm giving you the details, not so you're all envious of where I am, but um, to put a bit in context, we've got this large island and no public transport. Uh, we have the we have the school bus, um, but apart from that, people who want to get around the island either need to be on their bikes, walk, or, or do what most people do, which is get in their car or in their truck. Um, if you get to the ferry, I live eight kilometers from the ferry to the main island, and I do cycle, um, but if you get to the main island, and there's another community there, Campbell River, there is not a link to public transportation in town. There's no public transit. The bus depot has been moved to another part of town. And when you do um, actually get there, there's no connection with the times. If you want to go further south, if you want to go to Nanaimo for the main ferry to uh, the mainland, or you're going further south for medical appointments to Victoria or wherever else, um, you get onto a private bus. And uh, there is, again, no natural connection. So when I first moved to the island, I did live in Toronto when I first came to Canada, when I first moved to the island just over 20 years ago, um, this struck me as really, to be honest, insane. You couldn't go to town even to go to the movies, to the movie theatres at the top of the town, and you know, you'd have to take a car to do it. So I, I started to get interested in transportation issues and engaged in transportation issues, and was very privileged as the member of the Legislative Assembly, MPP for um, Ontario folks, uh, to work, and then as minister to work on this, uh, but obviously haven't solved the problem. We still don't have public transportation on our island. On other of the islands, um, there is some which has evolved voluntarily, but it, it's still an issue. And hence the theme uh, that I, I suggested, which is 
integrated transportation. I'm looking at primarily from the personal uh, the user's point of view rather than the commercial point of view. And I, I do hope I'm not going to be too BC focused. I think that apart from the, the integration or lack of integration of the ferry system in our network, it's much the same in both uh, rural and urban Canada across the country. So I think what we really need when we look at integrated transportation is, is to see the whole picture, um, the whole picture, whether that be local within a community, within a region, within a province or intra-provincial. And as I say, looking at it from the point of view of, of the user. There are, there are two problems as I see them, there are many more, but there, there are two key problems. Um, one of which is that provincial ministries, which I was the, the leader of one, um, the provincial ministries that govern transportation issues are largely renamed ministries of highways. Uh, they're filled with excellent engineers and these excellent engineers tend to look at the world from a pavement perspective. Highways cost a lot of money for upkeep, for repair, and to build new ones. And no matter where people are on the spectrum of uh, where we go in the future, the, there is the need to still build pavement. Um, just from my own experience, trying to expand bus lanes in certain areas, you need to build pavement. Um, so this takes a huge amount of a provincial budget in a Ministry of Transportation. So there is still, highways still get that, um, the lion's share. Even within the ministry, there is a desire for other usage of that, that, those dollars, whether it's bike lanes, whether it's more transit money, whether it's uh, money going to provincial support of rail, commuter rail. There are lots of uh, different demands on that, but uh, unfortunately at the moment, the mentality is still slightly towards highways and that's where the, the funding goes. I'm not denying the need for the infrastructure build. We, we do need it. Highways are important for integration, obviously, and we need those physical connections where there is a bus using it, a bike using it, or a, a, a truck using it. The second problem that I see it is also jurisdictional. So I know that Transport Action Canada is uh, very interested in rail and rail is a primarily a federal issue. Uh, transit, public transit is either a municipal issue. Here in BC, it's a partnership, it's provincial uh, and then delegated down to municipalities. Highways are a provincial issue, even the Trans Canada Highway is provincial. Um, and you notice as you go across the provincial borders that you're on the same highway and different standards of road. So integration, even in the road sense, uh, can be difficult unless there is a common understanding and a willingness to work together. It's a, an issue, I think, psychologically of how we can make sure that people do get that, um, the, the understanding of a need to have some greater integration and also financially, because you've got to have the priorities the same uh, within the different jurisdictions to allow that to, to mesh. And that's why I think in some ways, having a strong ministry of transportation uh, is, is vital to make sure that we can get uh, integrated transportation. So integrated transportation, um, you hear different words about it. You hear intermodal, multimodal, interoperable. I think one of my favorites is, and I'm gonna quote here, roads, bridges, buses, bike paths, sidewalks, services, and more than that, that work to comprise our transportation system. That comes from uh, an Idaho description of what integrated transportation is. What do I mean by integrated transportation? I mean, the ability to travel from one place to another, long distance, really short distance, long distance, with ease and comfort. And it, it's sort of, Strange to say ease and comfort, but without having to think too much about it, not how to put too many um, idea, you know, levels into it. So let's take this example. And again, it's going to be a BC example, and it may be a bit of an extreme example, but if we can make this one work, we can make anything work. Somebody wants to travel from Alert Bay, which is a, an island uh, further north than I am. It's just off the top end of Vancouver Island. It is a lovely little island um, and I welcome anybody to come visit it. It is 
largely First Nations and uh, non-First Nations, Indigenous, non-First Indigenous, who worked together, worked together for many, many years, um, linked obviously by ferry. They want to go, let's say somebody wants to go to Calgary for a, a hockey game. Lots of huge hockey fans in Alert Bay, I kid you not, this huge hockey supporting community. So they want to go to a hockey game. How do they do it? Well, integration, as I say, for me means ease of access, ease of travel, ease of payment. It needs to be convenient, it needs to be comfortable, and it needs to be affordable. Otherwise, even on a long distance like that, people are going to default to their comfort zone, their home on wheels, their car, or their truck. And I think we all, all of us who are car drivers know that you do get that sense, and particularly drive a lot, you do get that sense that your vehicle is your, an extension of your home. So how would you get from Alert Bay to Calgary today if you didn't want to drive? So you'd have to get from your home to the ferry. It's a small island, uh, lots of hills, not exactly pleasant to walk, and it does rain a lot in Alert Bay, even at the best of times. Um, so you would need to get a taxi or a ride down to the ferry. You wouldn't want to take your own car because there is no parking near the ferry. So that would be the first step. How would you get there? Then you get the ferry to the Vancouver Island, to the community of Port McNeil. Easily done, that goes uh, regularly. So you, you'd take that. Then from Port McNeil, you'd take a private bus to Campbell River, which is a community halfway down the island. Um, the private bus service uh, replaced another private service, bus service, Waving Flags replaced Tofino Bus, which replaced Greyhound. We lost Greyhound on the north end of the island many years ago, um, even before they pulled out of the rest of BC. So there would be, you'd take a private bus to Campbell River. At that point, you'd have to change to another private bus to get you down to Nanaimo, where the main ferry goes. Then you get on the main ferry and you buy your ticket, you get on the main ferry, and each stage you have to buy your ticket, obviously. You get on the main ferry, takes you an hour and a half or two hours, depending which route you choose, takes you to the lower mainland. At that point, you have to get on a bus to get to the SkyTrain to get to the airport, um, if you're flying, or you get on a bus uh, and then change buses to get you to the train station, which is actually the bus depot for Rider Express to get you to Calgary. Um, and that Rider Express bus, you'd mostly need to stay in Vancouver overnight because the Rider Express bus goes at about seven in the morning and arrives in Calgary at 11 at night. And each stage of this, you are hoping that um, all schedules get synchronized, that you are able to pay for it all at each stage, if you haven't been able to prepay or pay your ticket for BC ferries or whatever stage it is, you have to be able to ensure that you can pay it. And if one part of it falls apart, the whole trip falls apart. This is just traveling within Canada. And I think it's the same like if you're traveling from a rural community, definitely within the province, you'd have the same problems. Or you would do, you decide to drive, you'd go to the default. It is the easiest if you've got the money that you can do it for gas prices. Um, it is the easiest, just get behind the wheel and, and drive. So that's integration and the big picture across province, but it still plays out if it's only within the province. There, there are many pieces in the travel puzzle. So local integration, John, who is across the Salish Sea from me, who invited me here, um, has the Sunshine Coast Connector. It is a bus service, um, in, it's in his area, and it is li literally the missing link between BC Transit buses and uh, the ferry system. But it is a bus service that, correct me, John, if I'm wrong, I think only runs once a day and runs one way in the morning, one way in the evening, and uh, payment needs to be seamless. So I'm certain, not certain that payment is there seamless. And there is also the other classic thing when you're looking at transportation issues, that first and last leg of the journey to account for. So integration can be, can be easier in urban areas. I mean, we get, to, if you're in the TTC, you get your transfer, you, you can move from one, you, know, you can get from the subway to the streetcar to the bus all on one transfer. Um, I'm talking about when I was in Toronto 20 plus years ago when there were the paper tickets. I imagine it's all changed now, but there is still, you can in those urban networks, and I think the question, the issue is there, networks can travel more seamlessly. But you, you have the between uh, 
the, the connections between communities, uh, which is more difficult, how to get seamlessly between communities and within your own community. I mean, being realistic, transit doesn't cover all streets. It covers the main network of streets in, in, in communities. And so one thing when you're looking at integrated transportation, should we be looking at integrating it with other services? And whether it's ride hail or ride share with uh, e-bike or e-scooter rentals, is there some way to make it even easier to link the systems? Uh, and the other question I think is whether we can devise a system, and this comes back to networks, is whether we can devise a system for payments in uh, specific areas. And how broad would these networks be? So Scandinavia is often used as an example. It's used as an example for many, many things, but it's used as an example for this seamless uh, ability to get your, your tickets in one community and um, get your tickets for one service and travel seamlessly, whether it's across Stockholm, whether it's across Copenhagen, using their ferry system, using ride hail and so on. Um, one thing that the Scandinavian countries have and European countries have is uh, much cheaper, uh, much cheaper um, use of smartphones. They're not, to be honest, ripped off like we are with TELUS or Rogers or Shaw or whomever else we're using. Um, they have a much greater accessibility and accessibility is important. If you found yourself stranded without a, a smartphone that can use, you are going to be stuck. So it works better in those countries where it is, there are cheaper rates. Now, I'm going to touch on rail, and I know there are many experts of rail in this room. Um, I'm not going to say is the elephant in the room. Um, there is a, there is a possibility to build on existing networks, and I think in areas such as the um, southern Ontario, where there is the um, the question of high speed rail, the linking between um, Toronto and Ottawa and out uh, up to Montreal, um, is something that can be can, you know can be worked on for interconnectivity and integration likewise there is the possibility uh, to work on existing rail beds to grow out integration problem with that is um expense it's hugely expensive we we, we have uh, i looked at a number of possibilities in uh, BC when I was a minister and uh, unfortunately they were some were ruled out because of expense others you could see the possibility of how to build on it as a integrated uh, part of an integrated plan and I'll touch on that in a minute but the the issue of rail and making rail works I think everybody is um, aware for I'm European I, I love traveling on trains and I think trains are terrific but we need density and uh, in much of Canada there isn't the density in many provinces there isn't the density so how to actually make rail work it can integrate into other systems uh, again using the BC example in the lower mainland the west coast express built a number of years ago very successful commuter line fortunately as I said it, again it, it runs only at commuting times it's mornings into the lower main into Vancouver afternoons out of Vancouver but there is a uh, still that and if you're looking at the system of how to integrate it there is still the possibility there, there i think there is still the op opportunity but it definitely is part of a density question and part of a financial question you know, big big dollars to deal deal with rail so as i mentioned as, as minister um i introduced and examined or maybe examined and introduced a number of options in integrating the system, because I, I do think that this is the way forward of how we can move people along. One was, uh, as I say, Greyhound pulled out of BC uh, in various areas quite early, but they pulled out of northern BC, and I, I think like um, northern, I, I imagine it's more like northern Ontario than uh, uh, Manitoba or Saskatchewan, which which has many more flying communities. There is uh, uh, the, the road network limited, but people do travel on buses. Um, it is largely indigenous and people are completely stranded. There was no way that they could travel from Northern BC to Central BC, which is Prince George to get to uh, any, any service. So we did uh, uh, something that uh, hadn't been done before, and that was put the, the BC Transit, our public uh, provin provincial transit, transit, public transit service 
into the provision of a long distance bus. They hadn't done that before. They haven't expanded it at all, but in this uh, absolute dire need, that's what we did. In other areas, uh, we then did that. We sort of BC Bus North, it runs um, on a schedule. People may complain about how much it costs, but it's still a lot cheaper than Greyhound. It's about 40 bucks for a, a, a long distance ticket from uh, the most remote community to uh, Prince George. So um, in other areas though, we ended up having to rely on the private sector moving in, um, which was obviously very difficult. We worked with communities to try and encourage, but we, you know, in the end it was covered, but it was not, it's not a natural network anymore. However, I think that the replacement of uh, Greyhound with BC Bus North was a first step in integrating again. Another area is uh, South Island, south of Vancouver, southern end of Vancouver Island. For those who don't know, it is uh, it's where Victoria is, highly popular, highly attractive place to live, um, still one of the most expensive places to live and selling houses at ridiculous prices like much of Canada. But um, there is a, there's an issue of... Um, Geography, we have a lot of people trying to live in this very desirable area, trying to move in this very desirable area, um, and an infrastructure that has been built primarily on highways. So this one, we looked at how we could use the existing network and how we could potentially build on it. Um, so there, there is a rail line looking at how that could be built in, but primarily looking at um, how we could expand expand bus networks, how we could make sure that that integration happens, that there are bus lanes as park, park and rides, so that first leg of the journey can be dealt with. Um, so it's working on the, the existing, existing network and building that out. And then the, also looked at the Fraser Valley, um, which for those, again, not from BC, if you're coming down the Coast Mountains, you start dropping down and you start opening up to the valley and that's where you're heading um, towards Vancouver. It's uh, like about 150 kilometers long. This is our main, one of our main agricultural areas. Um, it's also where the Trans-Canada Highway runs through. Um, it is a choke point because as house prices increase and increase and increase, more and more people are living out in the valley rather than uh, closer to where they work in Surrey or Vancouver or, or, or likewise. So it's a choke point, choke point for commercial vehicles, choke point for personal vehicles. So I looked at how we could build out that network without building extra highway. Um, what, again, what rail lines could be used, how we could integrate between long distance buses, transit, translink, looking at how we could just get those different levels of uh, provider together, uh, as well as how we could actually start investing. Um, and then the final thing I was working on, uh, on as I think integrated transportation is active transportation, um, building up the bike lanes, building up the accessibility to biking and walking and alternatives to um, alternatives to getting into the car. Um, as I say, I'm I'm cycle commuter. The eight kilometers down to my ferry is uh, often done on on a bike. But one of the issues about integrated transportation is how to, get the, how to get the providers, how to get the operators to talk together. So here it means in the, um, in the big picture for the big systems, tran BC Transit, public um, provincial transit system, BC Ferries, which is in British terms, a, a quango, quasi autonomous non-governmental organization, highly funded by the government, but operates on its own. And TransLink, the, um, the public transportation system for the low mainland for the Vancouver, Surrey area. How to get them to talk together? Well, the, the, there are different levels, obviously. There are the levels of um, the bosses, the CEOs, all talking together, all having the great same ideas. Uh, there's a level of the operators talking, that those who are literally running the ferries, talking to the guys who are driving the buses. And I think that um, John mentioned a, a very interesting question. If you get on one ferry and you're about to miss the last bus, can um, who's going to talk to whom to make sure that that bus will still be there? It is a, there is a, lots of protocols. There are lots of employee issues. Uh, it is not easy to get even that level of integration. So it is, um, I, I have in my notes that it's almost impossible. I, I'm an optimist. I think we can get there, but um, it is, it, it, it de demands um, some suasion. And when it comes to other jurisdictions, I mean, municipalities are responsible for 
in, in BC, municipalities are responsible for delivering BC Transit. BC Transit is um, publicly funded. And as I say, back to my own example, the buses don't coincide with the ferries, um, just even locally. So it, if it's hard locally to ha make it happen in, in, it, within communities, if it's hard within a province, it's going to be that much more difficult to do it uh, federally or cross provincially. Now, I've not talked about where integration really can work. And um, it's, I think it's because it's it works because it's a systems-based network, and that is in the commercial sector. I mean, everybody nowadays talks about supply chain. We're all supply chain experts, but it, it, this is absolute um, transportation integration. Loading container in China, uh, and it gets loaded onto the vessel, vessel takes about approximately 13 days, ends up in the port of Vancouver, gets unloaded, gets put either onto the back of a truck or onto a, a rail bed, um, a, ra a rail car, moved to distribution point, whether that be further out in Vancouver or out to Calgary or in Kamloops or beyond, and then moved on to that to uh, centers across North America. And Vancouver is Canada's busiest port and you actually see it work. It's fascinating to watch the, these huge containers being unloaded and the, the speed at which it is moved on. Um, and this is, it works perfectly, except when there's COVID obviously. And when there is a, there is a bus uh, truck strike in North Korea, in, not North Korea, there's a truck strike in Korea at the moment, South Korea at the moment, which is slowing things down. But um, this, this is a system where the integration works and it works um, so that the, the corporations, the, the companies who are wanting to sell these products can deal with um, just in time, just in time delivery, or if they're using them parts, it is that just in time, they don't have to store, they don't have to stock. This is a system where integration really works. And, it's a, it, and I think it is it's a, a network very, almost a closed network has been developed in this way whether we could look at how we could be using adopting some of those uh, systems and i'm no systems expert as you can tell um i'm very much higher level but if we could use some of those systems in the operation of our transit and transportation we might be able to get uh, a smoother and more integrated service for for people i mean I do think integration, transportation integration is necessary. The world is changing. The needs of uh, our communities are changing. We have climate change where people are talking about um, whether it's electric vehicles, hydrogen vehicles, move to more trains. At the moment, there is still, we're, we're a car-based culture and it, it, there is ease and the comfort of the, the default of car. Uh, that, excludes those many people who either cannot uh, or choose not to drive or cannot afford to drive so um, we need to make sure that there is the, the the transportation available for people to move easily comfortably conveniently affordably um, we are a vast country and uh, as a country of colonizers uh, we started by we were integrated by transportation the rail system in, brought canada together as uh, as, a, as a say as, as colonial history um but i think that that integration of all of canada of all our communities uh in, indigenous non-indigenous uh urban rural is something we can aspire and work on um i think that integrated transportation both the uh, regionally, provincially is uh, an opportunity. I think it is, a, if you look at sort of the best bang for the buck, I think because you can ensure that people can travel affordably and conveniently, um, it, is a, it is a financial opportunity. And we really can uh, ensure that people can have an ease of, ease of movement and ease of mobility. Uh, if there is something to aspire to, I know that uh, the, this, your group started as uh, Transport 2000, and here we are in Transport, and it's now 2022. Um, I think that you'll be continuing advocating, I hope you'll be continuing advocating for many years to come, but um, if we can move on step by step, uh, we'll make it a more comfortable and easier country to move around in. And with that, I thank you very much for the opportunity to talk with you. Well, thank you very much, Claire. Um, 
your your thoughts very much echo uh, many of those many of those that we ourselves have uh, have uh, on on these issues and uh, i appreciate you going into some details on the 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 examples that exist in bc uh, you possibly noticed from my accent that i come from the you also come from the uk and therefore also when i came here in, in 2003 was rapidly disabused of the propaganda of this uh, country being united by rail because that a lot of the large part of that system does not exist anymore. Okay. Um, so I already see one person with their hand up and we shall open the floor to two to questions. Well, so I'm going to uh, give, you the, give the microphone to Linda Savory Gordon from Northern Ontario. Linda, you'll have to unmute. Here we go. Good. Um, thank you so much. Uh, there has been very interesting. And I just wanted to um, uh, to talk to you about the, one of the uh, points that you made. I'm obviously a, a passenger rail advocate, so uh, I'm going to have my biases. But uh, when you mentioned that um, the problem with rail in Canada is um, is the distances like we don't have the density uh, that they have in Europe, and then also financial. And on both of those points, um, we've been constantly talking about the fact that that the density um, is is something that is it, we're so sparsely. I'm from Northern Ontario, and it's really vast the distances that we travel. And yet we have to travel by the most polluting forms in a time of concerns about climate change. So we have to go by either road or by air. Um, and so um, the density uh, over those vast distances is a problem that has to be addressed environmentally as well. And we're not asking for like several trains a day. We even would like to have one a day, one return trip a day. We have, when I moved here in 1988, and was just shocked that we had no transportation by rail at all. And, um, and that's a huge problem also for people with disabilities because bus transportation doesn't work for people with, with the kind of disabilities where they have to, you know, ambulate often and they have to go to washroom and all that kind of thing or wheelchairs. And then the other point that you made about financial is that I've always understood that that really road has been has that the whole highway thing has been way more expensive than rail, particularly when it comes to um, the fact that every 10 years they have to redo the highways, dig below the cross line in northern Ontario, like they have to, we get potholes here, it has to all be redone um, very frequently. And so there's like just a huge amount of money that goes into that um, as compared with what would go into maintaining rail. So those were the things that kind of <laughs> hit me when you were talking about those. Aspects. Likewise, I mean, BC, we had um, up until uh, the early 2000s uh, from Northern BC, we had BC Rail. Um, the government of the day decided to sell it off. Um, made a lot of money out of it, um, and uh, that killed the opportunity for for rail um, through Northern BC. And it's something that uh, I, I know a lot of people have wanted to come back. There are still some links, I think, from Prince Rupert on the coast to Prince George, but then they are unfortunately um, sidelined by the 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 commercial the the rail going out to the port of Prince Rupert. Um, it, it is there. Rail is a huge cost. Uh, our, our road infrastructure is uh, exists. It is, uh, in many ways, uh, it's sad to say, it is more equitable because people who are in cars and in trucks and um, commercial users can use the road network as well as the, the buses. And yes, I understand what you're saying about climate change, but there is a there is a. We looked at whether you know any possibility at, at reviving rail there. Of reviving rail, there was a, a tourist line down on Vancouver Island um, that people are still clamoring uh, to have reopened um, as a commercial line. The, the, the costs of doing rail are so extraordinary that um, to ensure that there is the equity and service in transportation is one of the reasons why uh, I think we, we default to, to road um, uh, 
when we don't have the density, when we don't have the ability to move that many people. But I, I hear what you're saying. I, there is a, it, it's the, if it's there, it's the, the common sense is to make it work. Um, but it is the, the upkeep and that the cost of it is going to mitigate, is going to work against it. Okay, I have a question in the Q&A. This comes from Michael Richardson. Um, and he says, um, as the population ages and can no longer drive, um, do you think that will put additional pressure on to make all of this work, to make, these, make all these intermodal connections come together? And he does, he does also go on in a comment he's put here to, to say, well, with, with our immigration goal now being uh, you know, nearly half a million people a year, um, that's a new Toronto every six years. That's, you know, there's the, there are actually already areas of this country that have much higher density than we find in actual parts of Europe. Um, and the, this density argument, maybe, is, maybe that is going away um, over time. I, yeah, I think that, um, that, that there will be, I'm not sure it's so much aging. I know a lot of young people who, who live, in, uh, live in cities and never bothered to get a driver's license because why do they need to? They can, they, they can travel within their own community and uh, just outside it by using public transit um, and are happy or using uh, bikes and others uh, and are happy to do so. Um, so I, I think that there will be, um, there, there is a growing awareness. And I think it's also the, the question of climate change. The, the need to be as efficient as possible and to really to try and get people to move from the cars. And so um, that will be as much a, an issue as, um, as people aging. Uh, the question of density, yes, there are urban areas are becoming more dense, whether it is um, ar around Toronto, the 905 area, um, around, and I'm sorry to focus on Ontario and, and BC, the areas I, I know best, but, or um, Surrey and the, uh, or the, even the Okanagan in, in BC, uh, but it's the urban areas are becoming more dense. And so it's then gonna be incumbent on the providers of those uh, public transit systems and their pro provincial governments to ensure that the system does, does work. Okay, thank you. I've got a couple more hands up. I'm gonna to go to Peter Myasek, Myasek first, uh, who is our, uh, the president of our Ontario board. Yes, thank you, Claire. Um, I don't know, a lot, I'm from Ontario, don't know a lot about BC, but you did mention, I believe, that there are at least three publicly funded transportation agencies, BC Transit, BC Ferry, TransLink. And yet, I think I heard you say there is poor schedule coordination and presumably no fare integration. I don't know. Um, yep. What is the barrier there when, for example, a hardworking Minister of Environment could have maybe, or Minister of Transport rather, could have knocked some heads together maybe. We face the same issues in Ontario, so I'm just curious about why provincial agencies can't even get their act together. Well, I hate to say it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, but, uh, so in BC, using the BC example, um, BC Transit is publicly funded, uh, is provincially funded, but it's with contributions from municipalities and the municipalities are the ones that operate it. So it is then dealing on a municipal level and as obviously a provincial minister, I can't go to the uh, operations officer of uh, let's say the Campbell River set side of the BC Transit and say, you know, fix, fix my ferry, fix my scheduling so I can get a bus when I get off the ferry. Uh, likewise, I, you can't go to, um, the head of BC, the, the scheduling operations of BC Ferries and say, make this work. Um, it, I mean, it'd be very nice if I could, but it is, there is, um, there is no fair integration. There is no, and I think this is one of the, the, the questions that we really need to look at, um, is how you can get that integration to make it easy and make it accessible. And that's where I talk about systems and systems networks, because each organization has its own system for, for uh, introducing fares. I mean, BC Ferries, for example, has spent, uh, for those from you from BC who are listening, many, many millions of dollars um, in its new uh, reservation system that uh, still doesn't work effectively. Uh, it doesn't match with anyone else's reservation system. TransLink likewise spends um, on its own systems uh, and BC Transit is working with 
municipalities, 113 municipalities uh, around the province um, to try and make, make this work. So it, it, is, uh, it is complicated. It is a, a matter of getting that agreement that at the next stage, when we're looking at how to get to the next stage, that everybody will sit down and work together and that there is an agreed target that we do need to have this interoperability and that you know the there is a compatibility between systems but you also look at an organization that's just spent many millions of dollars to upgrade um mm. they're not going to they're not going to get to be honest they're not going to get away with spending another many millions of dollars to integrate at this moment because they've just done it so the, the, the public uproar would be astounding but i think it is a matter of actually just getting getting the conversation understood at all levels uh you know from basic grassroots from organizations like yourselves right through so um you know i talk to the head of bc ferris talk to um head of transit talk to the head of bc transit and say we need to do this and they'll say oh yeah we do we really do um, but getting to that next stage is uh, that much more difficult. Thank you very much. And uh, next, I'll ask uh, David Jeans to, to ask a question. And I have one more from the Q&A. Uh, yes, um, I, two things. One is I was going to point out that there were a couple of comments and questions uh, in the Q&A, but uh, sorry, in the in the chat. Uh, but uh, one of them has just moved to the to the Q&A. But I was just going to comment that, of course, the paradise from the point of view of fare and schedule integration is Switzerland, mm -hmm. where uh, you 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 have fully integrated schedules, not only municipal transit, intercity rail, postal buses to the to the remote locations, uh, ferry boats and even cable cars. Uh, but you do have uh, integrated ticketing as well, and you can buy a ticket from A to B, uh, regardless of how many modes are involved and whether your plans actually change. And maybe you don't use the modes that you originally planned because you're traveling an hour later than you originally thought. And traveling an hour later doesn't cost you. <laughs> you don't have to throw away your tickets and buy new ones. So uh, there, there really are examples of what can be done, though Switzerland, of course, is perhaps a special case, but it's kind of the utopia for what, yeah. what, what we'd like to see. And, uh, and certainly a lot of what you've described, I, I know, is, uh, is true, not only in Ontario, but in many other provinces. And uh, 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 Ted Bartlett, our, our uh, uh, past president of Transport Action Atlantic, has uh, made some comments about the insensitivity of, uh, of his transport minister in New Brunswick about these things. So those comments are in the chat as well. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over. And uh, Terry, you can go back to the Q&A. Thank you very much, David. Um, so a question from W.T. Beckup. Um, he asked specifically about the island, but this is actually a, a case um, elsewhere throughout Canada. There's one excellent network of public transportation that we have, and that's if you're a school kid who needs to get to school. Um, why are we not somehow using school buses um, outside of school hours or combining trips when school children are not filling the bus? What opportunities might there be? Um, to improve asset utilization and, and service levels uh, using that resource. Yeah, this is this is something that um, I think is is supremely challenging. It's it, the the spare seats question. I'll address that first because there's that, something that um, has ob is obviously cursed people. Is the, the school? I mean, each school district um, has its own rules and regulations, but it's a it's a question of safety. Um, they don't want people who are not uh, cleared, criminal record check, anything else, traveling on the buses with kids. It's just school bus, that's it. It's for school kids when, the, when it's being run for pick up and drop off of school kids. So that is, and I think that most jurisdictions are the same on that, that they would not allow um, other people to be on the bus. And it's different if you are 
on a public bus as a school child or a student, um, but this is a specific service run by the school district. And so it is for students only and uh, support and work you know, teachers or whomever who are um, with the students at that time. But even, I mean, even teachers don't get a ride home on the school bus at the end of the day or a ride to school on the school bus. So it, it is for the, 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 the kids. And then using it at other times, um, Jurisdictionally, it's an issue because it's a school district um, who are using it for potentially for school trips, for other uh, other operations, um, for trying to get a driver because of different systems between public transit and school transit. Uh, still need to have your, your bus driver's uh, license, obviously, what, the, the class four and so on, uh, class five license, class three licenses. But um, it is the, the issue of using the resource of one organization and uh, re repurposing it for another. Um, the just does not work. And I'd like to know one jurisdiction where it has worked. I, I've not seen it work anywhere. Yeah. I, 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 share, I share this, uh, this, uh, this analysis um, and uh, one of, one of our colleagues just asked, ask, you know, why is it that teachers can't actually use the school bus to get, get to and from school, apart from differences in timing? Um, because obviously teachers usually have a tremendous amount of work to do once the children have gone home. Um, you know, is there any opportunity there? Um, that, that would really be an issue for, issue for, the, uh, the, 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 uh, for the school districts and, and the, the, teacher, the teachers to work out. But... Uh, I, the other the other big issue in Canada is, and North America is our school bus, buses seem to be purpose built vehicles. Um, mm -hmm. They do not have some of the accessibility features you would find in a public transit vehicle, um, which is actually the, the opposite way to the UK, where quite often if there is a school bus um, to a, a rural school, it's a public transit bus that's being used temporarily for that purpose um, under contract. Um, and then issues only only arise if the kids kids manage to trash it in the morning and the, the bus has to be pulled out of service to be cleaned up, preferably by the kids. My father was a head teacher, um, <laughs> and, uh, but uh, there uh, you know that there's at least at least you're using the same vehicle and you haven't got you haven't got much, so, so much asset duplication in that situation. Mm -hmm. Harry Gare has commented um, that there is our situation in Quebec where this does work. Um, Harry, would you like to just speak to that a little? Yes, would you repeat your question, please? I, I just want you, I saw your remark that there are several areas of Quebec where the school buses can carry passengers. Yes. And I, um, I wondered if you wanted to just speak, uh, speak a little more to that, that particular scenario. Yes, surely for the last uh, couple of decades, the uh, Commission Scolaire des Chênes in Drummondville, Quebec, which is a medium sized town, about the size of Nanaimo, has a number of country bus routes coming into town and uh, they're used by commuters, uh, have been for 20 years. There's never been an issue of safety, harassment, molesting. Uh, it turns out that most of the passengers are grandparents and the uncles and aunts of the children on the streets and roads which the school buses serve. Um, this uh, paradigm has been extended to, for example, Manawaki, which is a northern uh, woodland uh, forest extraction town, a bit like Campbell River. And again, uh, the school buses started to be used by uh, teachers, uh, same at Mont Laurier, I think as well, uh, started to be used by teachers and then spread to other members of the population. It's very useful because while there is rural transit, often driven uh, in uh, uh, sort of a demand uh, basis rather than a schedule. While there is rural transit, it can't cover all the needs and the school bus is very useful at commute times. With the declining uh, numbers of children, uh, the, uh, there's a few empty seats usually. And the empty seats are for the public in several districts uh, of Quebec. And again, uh, no problem and certainly a lot of satisfaction expressed by the users, including teachers who can use this to get to school at the same time as the kids. And in fact, 
uh, issues of uh, harassment and carrying on by the pupils themselves are diminished greatly because when your uncle taps you on the shoulder and says, I think you're overdoing it, Johnny, uh, Johnny quiets down right away. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you very much for that example. It's, it's, it's very interesting and uh, I think uh, worth it, worth examining, putting into the mix for future for, uh, for other jurisdictions. Thank you very much. Yeah, th thank you, Harry. Um, Welcome. So I have a couple more questions that have been put in the, in the system here. Um, Sharon Roseman says, thank you for your presentation and discussion. It seems that fair integration should be a priority as it could work to push further schedule mm -hmm. integration over time. Um, as a lot of data is gathered about what user itineraries are, various modes they relied upon yeah. for their time to travel, et cetera. Um, one of the things, I'm gonna answer this question though, one of the things we've come across um, in discussions with um, the Canadian Urban Transit Research and Innovation Consortium and with the University of Toronto's um, Transit um, uh, trans Transportation Research um, Institute is the question of data silos and data data sharing in a way that protects the privacy of the users because the last thing you want is for your compass card or your oyster card mm -hmm. or your um, for your presto card rather to become a um, to become your ankle bracelet that tells the government exactly where you are at all times so how, how do we how do we leverage the power of big data to help to understand what travel demand is while making sure that we also in a free society, protect the privacy of the people whose data that is. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd say you can, you can uh, an, an anonymity. I mean, you can use the data without linking it to people. It's the anonymizing it. Of, I mean, as soon as you use any um, any piece of plastic, whether it is your um, your Oyster card, your whatever card you're talking about. Um, you get confused of which which is compass card in BC. Oyster card is the English one, sorry. <laughs> and um, whatever card you're using, or you're using your credit card because you can do the tap on your credit and your debit. You can you, know, you can pay quite easily. Um, you you lose your you know, you are sharing your information with someone, but a a company a, a, a transit provider, and then if it is a public transit provider, which it usually is, um, the the government itself. Can use that data anonymously. They don't have. They're not going to necessarily link it to a, a person. It's just like there are x many people going from Blogsville to Jonesville at this hour every day and returning via um, Hubertsville. You know, it's it's it doesn't have to be personalized. I think that that it's, yeah, you anonymize it. Thank you very much. Uh, and actually, that, that also leads into another question. Uh, Bruce Bird asks, um, you know, in Ontario, we have a very expensive resto card system um, in the GTA in Ottawa. Um, and other cities have actually kind of balked at it with the expense. Some have adopted, others have not. And you know, BC, we, I know we have the compass card in the lower mainland. Um, what reason is, is it that the compass card is not, uh, not expanded further across the province? Because it's TransLink and it's a separate uh, transportation entity, TransLink and BC Transit are completely set. Well, yeah, they're completely separate. TransLink operates um, only in the Lower Mainland. BC Transit operates in the rest of the province. Um, there is a closer. Uh, the governmental links are closer to BC Transit than to TransLink as a, a crown corporation. Um, uh, BC Ferries operates its own system, which is an experience card. If you are uh, living in an area where you have um, using ferries all the time, like like myself, but the problem with that, uh, and with I think with prepaid cards generally, uh, is that it is it, it costs a lot. So, for instance, on the BC Ferries card, you have to put in uh, it's ninety. Uh, it's ninety six dollars. You got to prepay, uh, and there are many people who can't afford that. It gives you a reduced rate, um, but there are many people who can't afford that, and so they're paying the full rate every time. Uh, so there is a there is a, an equity issue in prepaid cards, and there is a jurisdictional issue. If it was, um, if all the systems worked together, if you know, if in BC you had transit and ferries and tran and TransLink all working together, um, there could be some system. 
could be uh yeah there, there could be some system but it's and it's not i noticed in the comments that just one one call from the minister to the heads of these uh, organizations uh, i i wish i wish that that was the way it works but they they are running very large organizations that have uh, very many rules and regulations of their own so uh, i think it's it's a matter of looking at how we can move the, uh, the the dial forward rather than just sort of bashing heads and say let's do it it's just how, how do we get to that stage but there is an issue of an equity in any prepaid card that people there are lots of people who can't afford it and therefore they end up paying more that is a very very good point thank you for thank you for raising that point as well um one question from my from myself then is if not the minister um who can wield the carrot stick because we all know that when in, when integration works, um, that actually benefits everybody, not just the passenger, but each agency is also benefited because their their asset utilization is improved. There there are there are more people in the seats. There are le less uh, less seats running less seats on the any mode of transport running around empty. Um, there's less frustration if integration is working proper properly. Your 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 ferry driver or your bus driver is not being yelled at by the person who missed their connection because everybody knows what the system is but for accommodating that person. Um, so if not the ministers of transport, who can wield the necessary carrot or stick to take us a little bit closer to where the Swiss are? So I, I think that it, I think it's everybody. I, I think it's, it's the minister. It's making sure you're having the conversation. It's making sure that um, there is an understanding that this is where we need to go. And I, I think there is an understanding. It just doesn't happen overnight because you are talking about um, different agencies and it, you know this is bc where we are we're lucky because we've got three uh, agencies that are linked to government or supported by government uh, in other other provinces i know that you know, you've got the, it's the municipalities that run transit and i understand there's one municipality in, in in ontario has just gone to ride hail rather than running its own transit system so it it, it is getting the conversation continuing and i think it is continuing i think there is um, particularly as we're talking about climate change, as we're moving towards um, the growth of uh, not just ride hail, but car sh ride share, car sharing, um, bike sharing, all these uh, small steps are bringing together that concept of integration. And so if it can happen, in a, it's starting to happen in, in, in cities, it's starting to spread out. Uh, but I just think that it is, it is, um, not going to be an overnight thing. I think that in 10 years we'll be much more integrated than we are today. Um, there is also the question of how much uh, integration will, to be honest, will, will, will people want if it ends up being one BMS organization? Like if, if again, using BC's example, um, we had effectively the BC provincial ministry or a ministry running both running BC Transit around the province, Lower Mainland Transit through TransLink and the ferry system. I, as a politician for you know, almost two decades, I know that the public would, would balk at that. They would not want to see uh, a, a behemoth of that size. I mean, you know, looking at it as the state control, and we have enough trouble, to be honest, with uh, people thinking that uh, the, the government interferes in too many aspects of, of life. Um, and in BC, particularly on when it comes to things like the ferries, there is a huge uh, discord between government involvement and uh, who's going to operate it. So I, I think that I, I long answer to say it's going to happen. Um, there is a there's definitely a move to it, but I think it's going to be an integration rather than a creation of a, a one un, one unwieldy beast. Well, thank you very much. I, I just had a message that we have now, we have now passed two o'clock. Um, so thank you very much for your, your time over the past hour uh, and sh sharing sharing this with us. Um, it, you are welcome, of course, to stay um, for the uh, for for my, for my report and uh, as we as we move into the AGM uh, equally, if you uh, if you need to go. Um, thank you very much, uh, and thank you very much for your time. Well, I, I appreciate the opportunity and I appreciate all the work that you as, a, as an organisation do, because without uh, organisations such as yours, we wouldn't be able to push the dial further on. And I, I really do uh, value the work that, that you do. Unfortunately, I, I can't stay for your, the rest of your AGM. 
but um, you know, best of luck in the future and whomever, Terry, if you're staying on as the chair president or whomever takes over, uh, I think that you are a, a very important group in the, the dialogue about transportation in Canada. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that a great deal. And Bye now. Enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. So once again, thank you to, to Claire Trevino. Uh, we do need to move on to the main part of our AGM shortly and, uh, and my president's report. So Transport Action is the voice of intercity and rural passengers and in collaboration with local transit advocacy organizations across the country, also the voice of urban transit passengers that those services connect. We advocate, as we've just been discussing, uh, for integrated rail and bus networks right across the country so that Canadians can get around freely and aren't at risk of being stranded or missing out on some economic or social opportunity as a result, as a result of mobility poverty. And our work is made possible by all of you, our supporters, members, volunteers, board members, including our four regional boards. And so thank you, thank you for everything that you do um, that contributes to our ongoing task to advocate for the protection and rebuilding of the backbone of our national travel network, the passenger rail trunk, and to nurture the roots, branches, and leaves, the urban transit and city motor co coaches, rural transit that all depend upon each other, and that we as Canadians need to be able to depend on. One of our major activities um, in 2021 uh, was actually working with the Ontario government's transportation task forces um, through Transport Action Ontario or Ontario Arm and submitting a suite of recommendations, um, including cost estimates to Ontario's Regional Transportation Task Force for Southwestern Ontario um, that would address critical bottlenecks that are currently preventing the expansion of passenger rail in the region to meet the demand that we know exists and that would also improve the fluidity of that network for freight. And now that the Ontario election is over, we expect the final report of that task force to be released soon. And we've had some hints in terms of what was said by the uh, the Ontario PC party during the election that um, that our recommendations may actually have uh, been at least partially heeded. Fingers crossed, we, we hope for good news on that front. This year, we've also seen a welcome return to some in-person events and meetings. And that started with the high frequency rail announcements made by Minister Algarbra back last June, almost, almost exactly a year ago now, I was able to expect, attend the announcement in Toronto. And then on July 21st, um, there was a further series of announcements in London, um, which I was also able to attend and around Southwestern Ontario that indicated high frequency rail would be extended to Windsor um, in what was then described as a future phase. Um, there were no firm, firm details, but all of this was nevertheless highly encouraging for a project that we'd been um, waiting to see results on since, since 2016. At the event in Toronto, I was also able to speak with, uh, with uh, Cynthia Garneau, who was then president of VIA and her colleagues. And I was impressed by their interest in, in other subjects outside of HFR. Um, and that included um, uh, their interest in what's going on in Alberta with the, Cal the uh, Calgary Bands project, potential Calgary Edmonton project, um, the Prairie Link high-speed rail announcement um, of that study had dropped the same day. Um, and it's clear that with, with federal support, Via Rail could play an important role in the, these projects. Um, and the, the challenge really is getting Transport Canada to see the need for a truly national network, one that helps Canada deliver on its climate targets while increasing economic opportunity and social inclusion at the same time. Then the federal election was called. Um, obviously, that hits pause on HFR and other active decision making uh, by the federal government during the RIT period. Uh, during the federal election, we once again ran a nationwide online advocacy campaign, encouraging people to write to and to talk to their candidates about public transportation issues. After the election, um, things went a little bit quiet for a while as it, until the government was, uh, was, was actually formally sworn back in. Um, and then at the end of November, um, I was able to attend uh, together with um, colleagues from around the advocacy community and the rail media community, the I mean, unveiling of the first now. of the new Siemens trains in Ottawa. And uh, you'll find on our website an article with many details um, of oh, the new fleet. Somebody's unmuted. Um, sorry. Yeah, Peter Majasek, um, 
you need to un Peter Myasek. Okay, he's muted again now. Yep. Okay. Sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll backtrack a little bit. Yeah. So we were able to attend the unveiling of the new fleet in in uh, in Ottawa in November, and there's an article with many details of the new trains on our website. And we've also contributed to an article that will be appearing in a forthcoming issue of Passenger Train Journal um, about the new fleet and its testing. That testing continues, and we look forward to uh, additional equipment deliveries and the entry into service of that new, new Via Rail fleet soon. And as Via Rail began to ramp its services back up, um, Transport Action noted the absence of early morning trains from Kingston and London into Toronto. We believe these services are crucial and have been advocating for their reinstatement since the fall, including writing to Minister Al Garber on December 16th, um, because we understand that Ottawa's reluctance to fund additional operating costs during the service recovery phase is one of the challenges we are faces. We have, however, welcomed the federal government's ongoing contribution to supporting municipal transit operating costs, and we see where the services have been ramped up back up to and sustained at useful levels. Transit ridership across the country is gradually returning. All in all, things seem to be going quite well for VIA until March 9th. And that was when the federal government released its request for expressions of interest to build and operate high frequency rail. This document represents a noticeable change in scope from previous announcements, and particularly in terms of seeking to outsource VIA Rail's corridor operations to a private sector partner for 30 to 50 years. Uh, Transport Actions Board has held meetings with the Assistant Deputy Minister respons now responsible for HFR, and I have personally met with Minister Omar al Gabra to express our dismay at this further delay of the project and serious reservations about the consequences of the proposed outsourcing deal. On our website, you will find several articles that we have now produced covering the new risks we believe this development has introduced, and which we hope can serve as a warning to both government and industry. We've also been in discussion with Unifor, um, their representatives approached us. They are understandably concerned about this apparently severe load of via rail, not just the threat that it represents to existing collective agreements, but also a fear which is probably quite legitimate uh, that this could be a prelude to, to privatization or cuts elsewhere in the national network. In addition to meetings with Transport Canada's policy team during the year, um, we submitted an updated version of our pre-budget submission for federal budget 2022, again calling for a strategic rail infrastructure fund, which would include passenger and freight rail and projects that, that are win-wins for both. And again, repeating our call for via rail to receive the authorization it desperately needs to begin procurement for a new long distance fleet. Sadly, the only new capital funds VIA received in Budget 2022 were a top-up of 42 million towards station repairs and preparing its Toronto and Montreal maintenance centers to support the new fleet. And it is not clear with rising costs, with rising costs, that that represents enough funding to complete even those works. It has become clear that the 491 million, which was announced last year, is going to be mostly for the redevelopment of Dorval as a most a multimodal hub and related works in the Montreal area. Such a hub is a much needed and welcome development, particularly if Canada is to follow Europe's lead in replacing short haul feeder flights with effective passenger rail connections. However, we had hoped to see some of that money spent addressing other bottlenecks infrastructure needs beyond the corridor. So we will be continuing to push funding to address those. In budget 2022, there is another 380 million. Um, but this is for the high frequency rail procurement process that's been announced, um, money that Transport Canada's HFR procurement project office will receive rather than via rail itself. So we are concerned that this appears to be entirely for soft costs. On top of 71 million spent by the via Canada Infrastructure Bank Joint Project Office and on top of via rail's investment in preparing a thoroughly researched and costly proposal with the assistance of Sistra and others in the first place. And it does not appear to include vital funding to undertake preparatory works or to secure property along the route to safeguard the proposed alignment. So we're particularly worried about the failure to secure the route into Toronto at this time. Um, that would compound the problems caused by not securing access to the Mount Royal Tunnel. And 
could endanger the entire project, to be honest, um, or force a major route change that would further delay things. So we will, in the, in the coming months, be continuing to do what we can to put pressure onto Transport Canada to lift the veil of secrecy that surrounds the, the work done by the Joint Project Office. Uh, we may have to use access to information requests. We wish that the transparency was voluntary. Um, and to push to make sure that what ought to be a detransformative investment in passenger rail in Canada actually becomes one um, rather, than, rather than something which, which causes harm to the rest of the network. Following up on work by leaders from Canada's motor coach industry, who last year asked us to support um, a proposal for an essential bus network from coast to coast that would fill the vacuum created by the departure of Greyhound. And there are details uh, in the recording of last year's AGM uh, where Mike Cassidy addressed us. We have secured funding from the Canada Summer Jobs Program um, to employ a student for eight weeks this summer to undertake further research on the subject. On the bus front, um, we have seen Flixbus realize their ambition, which they shared at RAGM in 2020 to enter the Canadian market. And a number of other um, developments in, in the motor coach industry, despite the considerable challenges of operating in the, in the pandemic and with you know, ridership returning slowly. But thus far, we've seen far, uh, very few of the opportunities for potential synergies and connectivity between networks being seized. And in our presentation, you've just heard how, how important those are to the customer. And we also see Transport Action C's collaborative approaches as vital both to the usability and economic sustainability for the operators. And so that will be a subject that we, we continue to, to seek to address. Finally, with the recent departure of Cynthia Garno for Via Rail, um, from Via Rail, I would like to thank her for our work over the past three years. There can be no doubt that the combination of steering the Crown Corporation through the pandemic, um, while at the same time Transport Canada has continued its prevarication both on HFR and other time critical files like the release of the long distance fleet, has made the last couple of years a pretty challenging time to have served as Via's CEO. And so I wish Cynthia Garno well in whatever her future career turns out to be. So I see somebody's uh, popped a question to me in the um, in the chat here, and says, "Why are the Liberals, at least federally in Ontario, so wedded to privatization when it repeatedly results in higher higher costs, lost control, and accountability? And what can we do about it?" I would say it does not appear to be solely the Liberals. Um, and I would say, I do not know why they are. I do not know why governments do not appear to recognize the, the inherent risk of risk of what are supposed to be risk transfers to the private sector, dropping back on the taxpayer um, when the private sector fails. Uh, our colleague, David Jeans is currently actually a, um, involved heavily involved in the public inquiry into the uh, this very situation with the Ottawa light rail project and maybe i'll say a few words about that in a minute i i, I will but the hearings start on monday and run for four weeks so we will get answers to some of those questions terry yeah. but it, it is certain, certainly the case that um we believe that the decision making around these things is dangerously lacking in transparency um, and that it would be a mistake to lock in uh, particular service patents for 50 years. I mean, who, who, who knows what the population of Peterborough is in 20, 2080? Um, the Peterborough strategic plan certainly doesn't. It only speaks to 2030. Um, yeah, who knows what new technologies might come down the track 30 years from now um, that would change how this entire thing would work. And as we know, rail is only as good as the rest of the network around it. So any private operator know whether other, other levels of government and other operators are gonna to come to the table and help to build those synergies? No, they don't. You don't know that. You can't bank on that. You can only work towards that. 
Um, and that's something that the public, like ourselves, um, can hopefully play a great role in. Peter asked whether there's been much media concern about the HFR procurement plan. I sadly not. I mean, the media seems to have not really latched on to the that part of the thing as being problematic at this point. Um, and we need we need to whenever we can question it. Why why is this a a sub why why is this large risk? Um, apparently being uh, being ignored. Are there any further questions uh, for my president's report? Terry, I was just going to suggest that if we take a break now that we keep it quite short, uh, because we will need at least half an hour for the business meeting and uh, we should try to be finished by four and that people should stay logged into this meeting, don't log out and come back. That's a very good point, David. Um, do you want to say any words about the, the Ottawa LRT process now before the break? Yeah, well, I will. Some people across the country may not know exactly what's happening, but the uh, government, the Conservative government of Ontario uh, appointed a uh, essentially a judicial inquiry uh, that is uh, has been running since the beginning of the year uh, and uh, has already had extensive uh, 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 opportunity for public input including two evenings of the public being able to give five minute presentations about their concerns. Uh, they've reviewed a million documents of which over 10,000 have been identified as relevant and are on the inquiry database. Uh, they've interviewed uh, uh, 67 uh, witnesses, about two thirds of whom will actually be testifying over the next four weeks. And that very detailed testimony has all been recorded. There's uh, you know, uh, about 150 pages per witness. Uh, and as a participant, an accredited participant in the inquiry representing Transport Action, I have been interviewed as a witness and my testimony will be uh, online uh, on the public website. All of this information is going to be very public. The judge who's running the inquiry has made a commitment uh, that uh, documents that are subpoenaed will be made public. The report will be released as soon as it's ready. The target is to get it out by early fall. And uh, the, the uh, objective is to try and determine what was the root cause of all the things that went wrong with the rollout of electric light rail in, in, in Ottawa, which as you know, has had a very checkered uh, two and a half years of operation. So uh, that'll be what I'll be doing up to 12 hours a day for the next four weeks. And thank you, David. I know this is an absolutely staggering amount of work. Uh, yeah. And let, 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 let's hope that this is, this is not, you know, that this, that this actually produces lessons which get applied and that we have a lot more upfront transparency rather than this, this post hoc inquiry process for other projects. Yeah, uh, somebody just asked, what is the current state of the Ottawa operation? The trains are running. They're not 100% reliable, but uh, also they're very lightly loaded. And of course, a lot of the initial problems were uh, under heavy crowding conditions and also in winter. So we really have to wait until ridership is back up to normal levels. And, uh, and, and we're in the midst of winter once again to see whether the problems have all been fixed. But uh, but uh, so it remains to be seen, but the system is running. Now I was, uh, I've been on it several times in the last few weeks. Okay, thank you, David.